You're, every, you're every, everything that's wrong with the Western world. Just, uh... <laughs> oh, so says Gerald to Alexa Networks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> My tea never goes cold. <laughs> you're living the dream, Matt. You really are. I am the king of smart home pranks. Um, and I think because of that, it has led me to be truly fearful of the potential they have. This is Seriously, the only show on the internet that gathers three of the best tech journalists from every corner of the interwebs to argue the most contentious topics for your entertainment pleasure. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, even Spotify, podcast services like Google Podcasts and iTunes now as well. So wherever you're listening or watching us, please do consider subscribing. Make sure you get involved in the comments down below as well, because the topic we're talking about this week is how scared should we be of smart tech and the smart home and joining us this week to chat all about it is gerald lynch executive editor at tech radar sharon harding senior editor at tom's hardware and matthew bolton av and smart home editor at t3 each of you will have 20 seconds to give your opening statement and gerald i'm coming to you first are you ready yes i am good good your 20 seconds gerald starts now i am a Smart home enthusiast slash phobic. Um, I have about six smart speakers slash smart displays in my house. Uh, I am the king of smart home pranks. Um, and I think because of that, it has led me to be truly fearful of the potential they have. I love that. Taste of your own medicine. You do not like it. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Sharon, I'm coming to you next then. Where do you sit on this uh, on this topic? I think putting microphones and cameras around your home and connecting them to the internet is an inherently bad idea if you're someone who values your privacy. There have been breaches and vulnerabilities exposed about things like Amazon, Alexa speakers, beyond hackers. We know how thirsty advertisers can be. Ultimately, I don't think the reward outweighs the risk. Interesting stuff. And finally, then over to you, Matt. What do you think? I don't think we need to be scared of things overall but i do think that it's an area where being better informed is much more important than in some other areas of home tech i love this i love this already some differing opinions i love it a lot gerald you mentioned in there you have many smart speakers throughout the house and sharon you mentioned you think it's inherently a bad idea do you have no devices like that in your house then sharon i have zero smart speakers my TV is a smart TV. That's that's about it. I have a smartphone. I'm not I'm not crazy, but <laughs> <laughs> not that's crazy. about it. Yeah. Well, that's it, right? I think I think you know. Sorry if this activates anybody's devices at home, but uh, you know, Apple HomePods and Alexa speakers and stuff are becoming more and more of the norm in the household. And none of those features appeal to you, Sharon. You're not keen to dive into that world at all. Not really. I, the biggest appeal to me is being able to, you know, just say something like what's the capital of this state, for example, and getting that quick response. But I'm not the kind of person also who prefers to speak to something versus inputting it via typing or something um, with my hands. Like I review keyboards for a living. I'd rather type something out than speak to a speaker to get it to do something or perform a task for me. It's a really interesting point of view. I think certainly the vast majority of people are heading in the other direction, right? Wanting to speak to more of their devices. And Gerald, you you said there at the start that you have many a smart speaker in your home. What do you actually use them for? Um, mostly just to uh, annoy myself, really. <laughs> so I live with another technology journalist, which means that when we you know set about testing products, often we're testing the same sort of things at the same sort of time. So we have two independent um i'm going to say her name quietly because she's listening in the background (laughs) we have two independent alexa networks um going through the house so we have our own kind of setups um and (laughs) matt shaking his head (laughs) um and and um the amount of time that you know i might want to play um perhaps abba's greatest hits incredibly loudly sure whereas matt doesn't um, and they still come on on all the speakers around the house um, is is a is a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. It is a problem. And Matt, I think you foresaw that problem coming, right? As you were shaking your head in there, sounds like a bad idea to you. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a Gerald specific uh, problem uh, sure, having multiple sure. multiple Alexa networks. Um, I think this kind of tech is a 
slippery slope, um, not in the in the grand scary sense, although some people would say that, but it's so much easier to do what Sharon's done and have none of them. Uh, I think it's once you get one of them, you find a use for it. You kind of, for some people, it's asking for music or asking what the capital city of a country is or whatever. And then you try a Philips Hue bulb with it and you kind of go, well, that's very nice. And then you go, well, if I like having a bulb, maybe I'll get a smart camera and a smart doorbell and this and that. And I think once you start digging, it's uh, really difficult to stop. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think for a lot of people, that slippery slope started with stuff like Siri, right? It being baked into your phone. And nowadays you can't pick up a smartphone without that. So Gerald, I'm curious your thoughts on this. You know, is there really any difference between having these devices around the house as to having the phone in your pocket that does it all anyway? Yeah, I, I would I would um, counter what Sharon said earlier. Like if you're worried about privacy concerns in a smart speaker, I feel that you have far more of your personal data being mined at all times with your smartphone. You have um, any kind of uh, locations you visit, any apps you open and download, not only when you open and download them, but what you open and download them in response to. Are you uh, downloading them from an advert? Uh, are you opening a certain application when you're in a certain location? I think the, the means of tracking you from a smartphone are so far greater and wider and deeper than what you can get from voice on a smart speaker. Now, I appreciate there's there's kind of a, a cultural difference, I guess, in terms of the way we think about smart speakers and private spaces, right? So there might be certain things you don't want your smart speaker to hear in the bedroom, you know? Um, and that wouldn't happen, hopefully, on the street with your smartphone, you know? Um, so there is different kinds of levels of privacy that we're talking about. But in terms of the depth with which you can be monitored on a smartphone versus a smart speaker. I, I think it's, um, I, I don't quite agree that it's as dangerous as some people may think it is. Sharon, I've got to come to you and get your thoughts on that. <laughs> then if, you, if you've already got your phone in your pocket, what's the difference between a smart speaker? What do you think? Yes, and I already admitted I have a smartphone. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a dated one, mind you, and I did hold off for a little bit. But I, yeah, I do. I think that's a really good point, Gerald. But the, I, I come back to that idea of uh, reward versus risk. So the usefulness of being able to have my smartphone connected to the web when I'm out and about, when I'm lost in the city, when I need to look some, look up where the restaurant is, wherever it is, that's more helpful to me and worth the risk than being able to speak to my speaker or you know, have my fridge connected to the internet. There's just so much um, reward there that I think it is worth the risk when it comes to my smartphone. Um, versus the other products, smart home products that I don't see as great of a use for, honestly. I think there's another factor here, which is um, the even though the the smartphone privacy frog has maybe already been well and truly boiled, that we can still kind of set our own new um, boundaries if we want with new technology. Even though, yeah, Gerald's right. Like I've got a phone next to me here that uh, could do all three of the voice assistants, depending on which one I opened at that moment. Um, I, I think it's worth kind of, it, it's not worth just kind of giving up and kind of going, well, in that case, all my privacy is gone and I never should worry about it again. I think it's, it's fair, even though you can make the argument that it's not logical. I think it is fair for people to still go, well, I accepted that, but I'm not accepting this. It's an interesting point. And, and, you know, we see smart devices coming out more and more, right? Things that we never thought needed to be smart are becoming smart. Smart fridges, smart toasters. I'm sure I just made that up, but I'm sure it exists if you Google it. Um, Gerald, is there anything that sticks out in your mind over the past few years that has come out and you've just thought, we've gone too far? We've gone far too far with this smart tech. Um, I mean, to keep it PG-13, because um, there's some smart stuff that goes beyond X-rated that I think is <laughs> definitely a step too far. Beyond X-rated. <laughs> well, I mean, I Why make myself sound like some sort of strange connoisseur now, and I don't <laughs> want that to come across. Um, but I think some of the like um, smart pet stuff is a bit crazy. Like, if you're going to have a cat, feed it yourself. You know, that's <laughs> like... 
there's there's not much point in, in it otherwise if you're not going to actually do the caring element of having a pet. So yeah, I'm not I'm not too keen on that side of things. Well, and that's one where if the cloud goes down, that's really bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've gone on holiday for two weeks, um, and I've come back and my cat has ate itself because um, <laughs> the, the internet went down. Yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. I love that idea. Sharon, I know you're a connoisseur of CES. Is there anything coming out of sort of CESs that you've seen in the past or or maybe coming up in the future that you think we've just gone too far? We don't need these smart things in our lives. Um, So there's there's some smart beauty products I've seen that I'm kind of like, eh. So one of them in particular, I've seen a smart hairbrush, which can tell you when your hair is wet or dry because... How else would you know that? How else? And it, <laughs> it also has a mic in it, so it can hear the sound of your brush strokes. And then it could tell, you know, how damaged your hair is or if you're brushing too hard or whatnot. And, like, I don't know. I got a lot of hair. You just, you just, you just brush it, guys. You, you brush <laughs> yeah. it. If it's falling out, you stop. If it's tangled, you brush it. I just, I don't need it. I, 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 love, the, I love the thought of, like, your hair just going, like, wash me. Me to this little microphone and a brush, you know. And at a certain point, as someone with a lot of hair, you do learn your own hair patterns, right? Like you know how often you need to wash it and brush it for it to look the way you want. I don't think having it connected to the web and then to my phone to alert me that my hair looks bad is going to really help me. Well, that's the concern, right? The cynical part of me says, "Oh, that's actually really useful in the sense that, well, not really useful, but I can see the benefit of it if it says, "Hey, we can hear that your hair is damaged in this way. This specific brand of shampoo will definitely help with that. Why don't you go and buy it from this specific shop?" And and that's kind of the the cynical, dangerous world that we end up in if you take that to the nth degree. Matt, I'm curious: is there anything that you've seen over the past few years coming out that you think is just completely pointless and a waste of time. Uh, Well, I'll tell you what I actually turned around completely on, um, which was when I was first thinking about smart taps um, or faucets, if you like. And and I kind of thought, well, okay, I can see that this has a accessibility purpose, but the company was really pushing it as everyone should have one of these. And I thought, like, Really, you think anyone's going to want that? And then I found out that you could use your voice to ask it for a specific measurement, and it would exactly measure out. You just say, "I need 300 milliliters of water," and you just get it. And then I thought, "Okay, well now, now I want one." <laughs> <laughs> it's that killer feature that gets you in, and then they start selling off all your water usage data to the big, big corporations, and all of a sudden you're in trouble. Well, that's the sci-fi nightmare version. Until it sure. like mishears the measurement you want. It's like 300 million liters of water, like, <laughs> are being switched off, <laughs> poured into your kitchen. Is anyone thinking of the poor measuring cup companies that are going to go out of business? Nobody's thinking about the non smart <laughs> tech businesses that are going to go out of business because of this. Uh, Gerald, uh, Matt mentioned something really interesting there about accessibility, right? And And a lot of these devices are actually fantastic that's the kind of the way that siri was initially pitched was like oh it could read out your text messages to you so if you're visually impaired all of a sudden that's not as much of an issue for you do you think accessibility is is where this kind of tech lives and dies and and that's really what's gonna shoot it off into the mainstream oh i wouldn't say uh lives or dies because i think when we're talking about accessibility we're talking about a spectrum of needs right so sure. By, by the very definition, it's it, it's certain niches that need to be filled, right? Um, but they are hugely, hugely helpful in that in that respect. If you are partially sighted or or have no sight, and all of the feedback you get is audio, um, being able to talk to your voice and have information fed back with audio is hugely useful. If you have mobility issues that affect your ability to type, having something that can understand sort of like dictated word is is also really useful but then there's the flip of that and there's elements of smart speakers smart home tech that are inaccessible to certain people with certain conditions and um, issues so i think um so long as we keep it in mind of 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 the differing needs of differing people i think there's a, a lot of value in the accessibility of this sort of stuff so matt i want to come to you then Obviously, we've been talking a lot about the smart home here, the different devices you can get. Is there one device that you would recommend to everybody out there they should at least go check out, if not definitely get? 
The one thing I will recommend even to people who are completely skeptical of everything smart home um, and fearful of it is a smart smoke alarm. Um, in particular, I've got the, the Nest one. And it's the one thing where I see basically zero downside to it and so many upsides. Like it can kind of save a lot of anxiety in that it can tell you if there's a smoke problem wherever you are. It functions offline because it's still just um, something that detects smoke and emits a loud sound just within the house. So you don't have to worry so much as with some smart home products where if the cloud service has a problem or your internet goes down, it's a disaster, but this still detects smoke and makes a loud noise. But the thing about it that is really kind of, uh, you know, once you try it, you'll never go back is when it detects smoke, it doesn't just go straight to howling at you and terrifying the neighbors and the pets or whatever. At first, it just gives you a nudge and says, um, I, I can detect smoke. Is everything OK? And if you don't do anything like open a window to clear the smoke or just push the button on it to silence it, then it will kind of start blaring out the siren. Just the fact that you can burn the toast and it will just say, oh, um, have you noticed there's smoke? And you can say, yes, I have. Why don't you shut up? He's a game changer. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely and safety again comes back to accessibility right of these things that are just going to improve the lives of so many people sharon i'm curious then a massive point of this right is is self-driving cars surely that's going to be the most accessible smart tech feature coming in sort of hopefully the not too distant future what are your thoughts on self-driving cars are they the epitome of the most terrifying version of everything we're talking about today or are they incredibly useful so yeah, smart cars is where I kind of um, open open up my mind a little bit because I do see so much use for that where it's worth being connected because like Gerald said, there are a lot of different disabilities and impairments and that will enable some people to get around more easily than they would have been able to before. So in that scenario, yes, I think there's greater reward there, um, potential for greater reward that makes the risk worth it. Uh, for myself, I happen to be able to drive um, a standard car. N not that great, but I can do it. But, <laughs> but so, yeah, so I personally don't want one because I'm, I'm happy driving a car, um, a standard car. But there's I do see lots of reasons to do smart cars. And again, like the human error in driving currently is is really, really large. It's not one of those things where I'm so confident to say, oh, a human could do that better than tech because we know how bad drivers how bad drivers are. Like, I am scared of that because the idea of that crashing or getting hacked when you're in the middle of the road, yes, that's terrifying. But the potential of, you know, so many people being helped and being able to get around and drive and experience different things, I think is worth investing in that technology and improving it. Yeah, 100%. The investment part of it is the difficult area, though, isn't it, Matt? Coming to you, obviously, the, in the best case scenario, every car on the road is a driverless car. They're all talking to each other. They're all sharing that information to make themselves most efficient. How far off of that do you realistically think we are? Do you think we'll ever get there? That feels like the best case scenario. Does it feel ever truly achievable? People really like ownership of things generally, including their cars. And in some ways, the, the idealized version of a driverless car society would probably be that yeah, no one owns their car and they're all, they're, you know, they're all electric cars that just whiz off to charge themselves when they get low. And there's always just a rotating uh, list of them available. And in that case, should they be like municipally owned um, or what does the management of that look like? And yes, it is hard to imagine right now us getting to that point. Um, I've been a huge uh, stan, as the kids say, for driverless cars for ages. I've been like advocating for them a lot for all the region, reasons kind of Sharon said, but increasingly as we see the attempts at them that are kind of being tested on, on the road. And there was this story recently about the Tesla self-driving system getting tricked by to driving up to 85 miles an hour by just slightly tweaking what a 35 miles an hour sign looks like. And I kind of find myself going, for years I've been saying this is the future, but I'm not sure if the people currently developing on are capable of delivering us that future yeah it's an interesting one right tech is always baby steps right it's always little innovations here and there that build and eventually we look back 10 years ago and think but well, smartphones were terrible back then look at them now but when we're talking about cars we're talking about people's lives it's it's a whole different ball game gerald i'm curious your thoughts on this one are you all for the self-driving car future or does it terrify you a little bit 
Yeah, well, I can't drive. So if someone wants to get me a little, you know, robo car that can take me <laughs> where I want to go to do the shopping, that's that's amazing. But I, I think that the bigger issue is it's it's not just a it's not just a technology issue. It's an infrastructural issue, right? We have cities that have been designed from scratch in many cases now over the past hundred years or so to accommodate cars as they exist now. Um, to to upend that involves adding new smart technologies and infrastructure, not just to every single car on the road, but to every single street they wish to drive down. So I think we are a long, long way away from that. And, and there definitely isn't an immediate desire to update the entire world's existing road structures, you, you know? So I think a hybrid sort of situation where cars can do some functions for you, like, you know, parallel parking or what other difficult things you car people have to do each day. Um, <laughs> yeah, you got it. Parallel parking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, like those sort of functions that can be done on a kind of smaller scale, sort of um, uh, a, a, some, a car that can understand its sort of immediate contextual environment, as opposed to having to interact with all other potential variants in the entire road system. I think we'll probably get to that and are pretty much approaching that quite soon. Um, but that whole vision of like a Jetsons like future where, you know, what, what's that film? Is it Total Recall where you hire a Johnny Cab or whatever and he just takes you wherever you want to go? Like, I think we're, we're a way away from that yet. And that's the difficulty, right? All of these things that we've talked about, they have their pros, they have their cons, and, and it's very difficult to kind of sit on one side of the fence or the other, right? And as we progress and sort of look back, we'll realize how far we've come, but it's but it's baby steps all the way along until that point. I'm curious then, and I'm going to throw this curveball at you all, so maybe you'll need a second to think about it, but I want to hear one piece of appliance or something in your home that isn't smart that you want to be smart. If somebody came out with a smart blank tomorrow, you'd go out and buy it straight away. Gerald, I think I'm going to come to you first, put you on the spot while the other two have a think about it. What do you think? Okay. I'm thinking a drone cleaner, some sort of mini drone that you can put like a little sponge on its little feet and it'll hover down onto your stove and, you know, give a little scrub. Um, I love that. Maybe, maybe that, or, you know, dr some sort of, smart toilet cleaner who's only like maybe a little robot whose only job is to clean up the jobs that I really don't want to have to do. Um, 100% sure to be the first robot to rise in the eventual robot uprising because <laughs> that is a role that no one wants. But yeah, maybe 100%. something like that. When, when you initially pitched that, then you said drone cleaner. I thought you meant a cleaner for your drones. And I was like, hey, ah, you're already living in the Jetsons if you've got so many yeah, drones. My, my fleet of drones. Let's not <laughs> get started with that, Matt. That's another problem. <laughs> Matt, I'm coming to you next then. What smart appliance would you go out and buy tomorrow if it was a real thing? I mean, part of the problem with you asking um, uh, the smart home editor this question is, I already have things that are smart that would make people furious. I have a smart <laughs> mug. That is insane. What is smart about your mug? So I can choose the temperature I like my tea at and it will keep it at that temperature. Wow. Does it work? It's it's incredible. The problem is I just tried it one day because, you know, they sent it to me to test. And then I kind of, you use it for a week and you go, I can never give this up. <laughs> can never go back to common, well, normal mugs. I could just I could just see post-pandemic Matt going around to his friend's house and just like looking at their their cutlery and Tupperware just like <laughs> with utter disgust. Like this oh. tea is at least at least four degrees colder than I would like it. How dare you <laughs> serve this up to me? Disgrace. You, peas you peasants. Yeah, does it work much uh, better than like a good thermos with a lid? Because I'd be like burning my tongue still on a cup of coffee <laughs> after like an hour with one of those. This is the thing. It's not <laughs> uh and it, you know, and it sounds so ridiculous basically it's not about just keeping it hot it's about keeping it at like the idealized <laughs> temperature so the whole thing is like yeah it's not just that kind of oh i pour the water in it just 
keeps it heating or whatever. I say, I like my tea at 59 degrees. And it sends me a little notification on my phone when, well, and my watch, in fact, that when too my much. tea is at the <laughs> correct temperature to drink. That is and that's it too much. at that temperature. And it's that thing of, it's, you know, it sounds completely ridiculous, but it's that point of, you know, we all like, we all have coffees or teas or whatever that we get halfway through and we forget and you come back and you go, oh, man, my tea's gone cold. My tea never goes cold. <laughs> You're living the dream, Matt. You really are. I'm living the dream. Anyway, the actual answer to your question, and these do exist, but I would love a smart shower where you just get the perfect temperature every morning. No fiddling with the taps. You just kind of go, right, it's Matt's shower time. And it goes, ah, I know what temperature Matt likes to shower at. And the way it goes can't you just get a lo- can't you just get a load of their mugs and have them on like some sort of pulley <laughs> system and, like, fill it on you. <laughs> that that is seriously the jetsons right there that is the perfect jetsons invention sharon then coming to you finally i know you don't have many smart devices in your home convenience <laughs> will have to be key what is the one smart device that could come out tomorrow that you would have to cave and go get it Man, there's not really many. I was thinking about something that would help me with um, taking care of my plants, which might already exist. I could read, you know, the water levels and things like that. But I thought of something a little bit better. So a smart calendar, not like the one in your phone, like an actual paper calendar that totally invades my privacy and goes through, you know, my text messages, my emails and my Facebook to gather all of the the events that I have, you know, people's birthdays, appointments I have and puts them on it, virtually wipes it every month, or I could slide, you know, through the next um, months. But it's also something I could like hang up on the wall. And then eventually I could hopefully delete my Facebook and all that and just remember my friend's birthdays. It's so weird that you brought it up because just before we went on this call, I like was just going through my mental back catalogue of 10 years of tech stories I've written. And there was this thing that came to mind. Um, there was this amazing concept for like an e-ink calendar that was synced up with your Google calendar. Um, so you hung it on your wall, big e-ink sheet, you know, low power, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, you put in your little thing when you're on the go and then you come back at home and it was, it was all there. It was great. It should also be able to take, make the picture anything I want from the internet. So right now, like there's a nice paper one with different shots of space. So I don't want to lose the fun of a new picture every month, or I could switch it easily to like a word of the day. All the possibilities. Well, I think the four of us should put our heads together, make this thing, and this time next year we'll be millionaires. That's yeah, the only I think there's, way a to kick, go. there's a there's a Kickstarter waiting to happen here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I really like as well, Sharon, that you're somebody who doesn't have any smart speakers in the home. is very concerned about privacy. But if a product came out that completely invaded your privacy, as you <laughs> said, completely <laughs> invades my privacy, looks through all of my texts and calendars and emails and everything, throws it up on a screen, I'm all for that. That is a, that is a big U-turn. To be fair, will I actually go out tomorrow? No. <laughs> and buy it. I'm pretty lazy. Um, but yeah, I can't really think of anything that like it really has to make something better or so much easier for me to want it. So even when I think about like, oh, it'd be great to have something that helps me monitor my plants, like that's not as important necessarily as like remembering my mom's birthday, which I don't need a calendar for March 2nd. I got it. I was going to say that is the most important <laughs> day that we all need to remember. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. Really do appreciate it. Please, if you're watching at home, do comment down below. What is the craziest piece of smart tech you've seen out on the internet? How afraid of the smart home are you? And of course, leave a comment. Let us know what you thought of the show. Maybe even leave some ideas for future topics that we can cover on this show. We'd love to read all of your fabulous feedback. Thank you so much for joining me, everybody. Please do like the video, share it with your friends. Why not? And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.